very glad to see you here for this combined side event, starting with the Global Eco Village Network, continuing with the International Network for Sustainable Energy and the Nordic Focus Center for Renewable Energy. We have a lot of presentations to, uh, on the way. Uh, we will have very short time for comments during the time, but uh, beside that, all the things we'll be presenting here will be available on YouTube afterwards on the UNFCCC um, channel on YouTube, so don't worry if you don't catch some words we are saying on some slides we are showing. Everything will be online afterwards, and presentations from the different organizations will also be up to see on the website, so don't worry, but just listen in and enjoy and then I'll give the words for Global Eco Business Network. We'll take the first half, and then we're coming back with Enforce and Nordic Folk Center for Renewable Energy. Thank you. Thank you. So warm welcome from our side, from the Global Eco Village Network. We are delighted to see you here. Um, we are having four short presentations, and we would love to have some space afterwards for questions and comments from your side. Um, today, we're going to be speaking about the improvement of nationally determined contributions through on-the-ground community development, um, eco-village development, energy access, and zero-carbon approaches up to the level of zero-carbon societies. So we're really excited to share this with you because we feel it's a part, a very important part of the puzzle if we speak about climate change. Um, there is so much more we can do when we work with the people on the ground and learn from the people on the ground instead of taking decisions over them. So this is what we want to share with you. And um, we will start today with Tim Clark, who's been an EU ambassador to the African Union and Tanzania, working with many different European institutions over years. And Tim has through those years, those many years of experience, become more and more convinced that real change comes when we empower communities, when we empower women, when we empower the most vulnerable. Those that often we like to look away from if we really look there and empower these people. And he will speak today about the European network of community-led change-making around climate change. So. Let's give a hand to Tim, and we look forward to hearing from you. Let me try and get the tape. They're on. You don't need to do okay, anything. Okay, so I do nothing, I do nothing you do for the nothing, technology. You do nothing, which is really helpful. Do you need to move the slides, yes. or do I move the slides? Uh, you can. Uh, a very good afternoon to you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great honor and privilege to be with you this afternoon and to share this uh, platform with so many eminent individuals and organizations. My humble task uh, is to start the, the ball rolling on behalf of an organization called Ecolis, which um, rep represents 36 different groups based in Europe, but those representatives also have sometimes a global outreach. And our main focus is on community initiatives for um, confronting addressing climate change. I'm on the member, I'm on, I'm on the council of Ecolise. I sit with a hat which has been offered to me by my, uh, my dear friend, <laughs> Kosha Juba, next to me um, as the CEO of the Global eco Village Network. I'm going to talk very briefly about the importance of local communities for true sustainability. Um, the uh, organization itself was established in May 2014 and has 36 member organizations throughout the European Union. It's gathering speed. There are more associations that wish to join us. Um, and the basic, our basic raison d'etre is to provide a platform to share information, knowledge, experiences about how local communities take control of their own lives to address very worrying developments that are taking place around them. I would just briefly uh, introduce one or two of those, those organizations. Um, permaculture is 
really at the core of what we're doing. It's a form of sustainable agriculture and systems which is non-harmful and productive and we are trying through one of our organizations, the Permacultural Association, establish a different way, a different paradigm for dealing with uh, agriculture throughout the world. Another organization is the <laughs> um, is the Transition Network, which started in Totnes in southern UK, and has had massive influence in trying to change the way in which communities can influence policy at a very local level. The Transition Network has got movements throughout the world, and the last COP21, in preparation for the Paris meeting, a book was produced called 21 Stories of Transition, which is available, which tells personal, individual, community stories about how, if you are empowered as a community, you can make a massive difference to your livelihoods. So the Transition Network is a very important element of the Ecolees structure. Another one is GEN, the Global Eco Village Network. Massive numbers of eco villages across the world, and, and Kosha next to me and Linda uh, will speak about this uh, in a moment. Its historical base is at Findhorn in, in Scotland, has celebrated its 50th anniversary. A growing movement touching people across the world. Another is the Gaia Education, Gaia Trust, who's been working now in 43 countries, sustainable education programs, getting to the core about how we as a, a community can learn to adapt, to train, to modify the way in which we, we do our business. So there are a number of different organizations. Some have a, an interna international profile. Some have part of national networks. Some are focused on policy issues. Some are focused on training education. There's a wide variety of interests. And our purpose here is to try to influence at an advocacy level the work done by the COP22 and to gain support and other networks to join arms with other institutions, associations who wish to work with us. One idea that we've had which we're going to develop next year is the so-called European Day of Sustainable Communities. We've just finished a training course in Brussels with the European institutions. We're beginning to make an impact. Another organization, um, this is just a, I thought I'd introduce the, a publication that's come out which is available on how local communities can really be the, the leaders for a low carbon existence. So some key messages, there are two, three slides and then I'm, I'm over. Our general feeling is that the current uh, INDCs are virtually silent on the communities and what communities can, what difference communities can make. Local communities don't have access to finance. They are not heard in many countries because of governance issues. And that severely impedes uh, their potential impact at a policy and also a realization way. In our judgment in Ecolis, true sustainable development is impossible without local communities being the drivers of that process. Local communities, local solutions. And we want, use us, we want in Ecolis and in our institutions to be part of the, the learning process for bringing communities from the shadows and making them the real drivers of, of uh, local democracy. And the outcomes we're hoping for this meeting, greater social inclusion, local ownership, generation of more employment in, in, in village areas, access to untapped resources and knowledge. This is one of the key areas which is lacking, so lacking in formal documents, but our communities have that knowledge. And we believe that if communities are at the center of the process, it really will ensure the long-term success of any interventions. We believe strongly in equi 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 equity, equitable development, and a holistic view. And we believe also that if communities are really at the center, there's a real chance of resilience and a buy-in for success. 
So those are the key words I wanted to leave, key messages to leave with you. Thank you for your indulgence, and uh, I wish uh, the rest of the panelists a very productive uh, presentation too. Thank you. So thank you so much, Tim, and I think that's whetted our appetite for the following presentations. Um, so as Tim said, these kind of community-led initiatives have really mushroomed over the planet where people on the ground say, actually, we want to make a difference in our communities. We want to take care of our environments. We want to take care of the people who live here, of the animals, of the plants. We really care. And there is a heart connection there that has a lot of power in implementing change processes and also has a long history in ancestry of place. So we want to move now to another place on the planet where the Global Ecovillage Network is working, which is Zimbabwe. We have just signed a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Environment in Zimbabwe for the implementation of ecovillages across Zimbabwe. Um, this little powerhouse here, Linda Cabera, has been instrumental in this process. She has been working for the past decades on greening schools and from the empowerment that comes from greening schools, situations where often we have malnourished children doing their best to concentrate on their classes and not doing very well, while in the morning, every morning, the ground around the school is swept clean and is totally naked and transforming these places into spaces where the bananas and the fruit trees are growing into the classrooms and there is a total abundance of fruit and no child needs to be hungry anymore. So this is part of Linda's work and please give her a hand and we'll hear more from her. Thank you. So coming from Zimbabwe, uh, where I've lived for um, over three decades now, <laughs> realizing the change that has been happening in the community where I live, where we used to pick fruits, where things used to be very pleasant, where when you go to school you'd get milk, and lots of uh, abundant food. And looking, at, uh, looking back three decades after, you cannot find those things. You can hardly even get water to drink. This is the story that I'm going to be talking about. The story that is at my heart, where we often think that uh, young people don't see things happening. Young people don't matter. Young people don't account for the changes that are happening in their lives. So my presentation really is a cry out from young children that are saying we are not too young to be involved. If we are involved, this is our planet too. We need to be responsible and we need to take a part into it. So this is the story that I'm going to be sharing about of actions that young people are doing. And the reason why we are doing these things is because of the, the risks that are increasingly happening. We have the increase in droughts, floods, greenhouse gases, food shortages, and fresh water. So with these changes that are happening every day, the cries and all that, this is the reason why we are doing the work that we're doing. And often you find that uh, young people go to school hungry. In Africa, I don't know in other places, but in Zimbabwe, young people go to school hungry. And yet they are forced to be sweeping the school grounds. There is no food at all. Uh, the ground is usually very bare. And yet all they do is to sweep it. And in the last year, we experienced uh, the El Nino, which forced the children to really s harvest nothing. And in most cases, the children are the ones that suffer a lot. So apart from just the food drying out, there are a lot of other things that are happening that we see happening every day. And um, my work with uh, an organization called SCOP, which started some over two decades ago, is really about um, transforming the bay landscapes into lush and edible landscapes. The, ed the landscapes that you can see now where children are involved in making of squirrels, harvesting water, replanting and regreening the, the, the yard, the school where they are so that they can harvest food. And this project also involves the community where the community also 
gets an opportunity to come into the school and question what is happening in the school. Uh, um, what's been happening, I don't know, but um, what has been happening really is that the education is focusing mostly on the theoretical part and not on the practical part. So it's so much focused on getting the exam, getting things right, and yet uh, there is nothing really that is done practically to equip the children. So that's our focus as well. So because of the work that we've been doing, we actually found that kids smile a lot when they start harvesting, picking pumpkins in the schoolyard, picking vegetables. And apparently in my country, there is a school feeding program that the government is implementing now, but all they do now is to provide maize which is just starch. So with the program that we, we're implementing, they can provide their beans to supplement. They also produce vegetables, uh, some fruits, which then makes their diet balanced. And um, then that fights the 35% stunting that we're suffering from. If you can notice from the, the pictures that I have, I'm actually trying to show the, the, the changes that are happening, the before picture and the after picture where probably within a year or two, you find the changes that are happening from a bare landscape into a green and lush landscape. So it's just uh, some pictures. Yes. So these are some of the changes that are very amazing when, when the communities and the children come together, agree on what is it that they want to achieve. They can actually harvest food instead of them just sweeping through the ground. And this also is a, a good way of creating some microclimates that are safe for the children to learn. They get the harvest food and some temperatures around the school also become cool as, as there are trees around. They also work on nurseries to regenerate the forest around the school and around the community. So then the community also gets a chance to come into the school, get some seedlings, go and plant. We also focus on uh, food sovereignty through seed saving where they also celebrate their local seeds plant them, harvest them, and then they also celebrate being Zimbabwean and being an African as they eat dishes that their grandparents used to, to eat. Within the process, we also facilitate uh, the making of the dishes so that uh, they can also celebrate. We facilitate celebrating World Environment Day, World Water Days, all the other in, uh, events that bring the communities and children together as a community. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And maybe just to add to that, this was Zimbabwe speaking, but this program, which starts with greening schools and then spreads actually to, to from there reach out to the whole community and transform the communities into eco-villages, has spread from Zimbabwe and is now working in Malawi, in Zambia, Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and have transformed over 600, probably now even 700 schools in this whole region. So it's spreading very fast and changing many people's lives. These are the kind of solutions that actually don't need huge investments. The main thing that is needed is the spreading of information, of inspiration, and offering people on the ground the opportunity to get their hands dirty, get out there, become part of the solution. So, yeah, I will continue. So, as Tim kindly said, my name is Kosha Joubert, and I am the currently work as the executive director of the Global Ecovolution Network. I was born in South Africa under apartheid, and I think that's where my, my deep longing for oneness on this planet, for deep communication between all cultures, and for true solidarity with one another grew from. And I have the most wonderful job in the world because the Global Ecovillage Network reaches out to communities on all, on all continents that are implementing solutions right now. So yes, sometimes it, it truly stretches my heart beyond what I feel I can hold. When we, ho when we hear about the villages in Zimbabwe that are crying because their seeds are not growing because the droughts have come, or the our, our communities in Bangladesh where, yes, the next floods are hitting now, or our communities in the Philippines where the next hurricane is hitting, 
You know, this is, we're not speaking about something abstract here. These are our friends. These are our sisters and brothers that are being hit by climate change now. So yes, while we speak about abstract solutions and financing, we need to really connect to what is happening on the ground and connect to each other as people. I think this is where a lot of quicker action will grow from. So speaking to the Global Eco-Village Network, we've been working for 20 years, not actually setting up eco-villages, but just really honoring what people all around the planet are doing. We do not believe that it is part of our human existence on this planet to destroy the world around us. That is not why we were born. We, are, we have come to this planet at this time to be a part of the solution. And we know that we can do this. We have eco-villages around the world that show that we can do this. We have regional networks in the different continents. We work together as the global eco-village network. We have NextGen, the youth network of Gen Active. You can learn more, you can come and visit our booth, booth 8A, and hear more about definition of eco-villages, the playing cards that we've developed, and how we work. But for now, we're really here to, to share with you that eco-villages need to be part of implementing solutions in your countries. And we'll share more about that in a moment. So, yeah, we put communities at the center of development processes. When we speak about eco-villages, we speak about intentional communities. This also includes people migrating to new places, refugees, and needing to create communities intentionally. We speak hugely about traditional villages that are transitioning to eco-villages, where we have people really honoring what they have, what they're worth, and coming together to consciously design their own pathways into the future. And we're speaking about urban eco-villages, communities rebuilding themselves in urban environments, bringing nature, gardening, but also solidarity with each other back into the city. And at the core of GEN lies this simple map, which is that we say, actually, true development is only possible if we choose a holistic pathway. So we'll share more about that, but we bring together this, the four dimensions of sustainability, social, culture, ecology, and economy into a whole systems approach. And we know, we know how to rebuild our soils. We know we have impoverished our soils across the earth. We're losing our hummus. But we know how to rebuild these soils. We know how to use biochar, which is also sequestering carbon, to rebuild hummus layers around the planet. We know how to work with organic agriculture. We know how to replenish the water tables. We know how to implement renewable energies on community level. We know how to create closed waste cycles, how to work with green building techniques. We know how to regenerate our ecosystems. But we can only do this if we work together across all divides, if we stop seeing solutions only on a national level and really see we are in this together. We're in one boat, rebuilding solidarity, uh, a sense of sharing and generosity, which are values that are still so alive, for instance, in many countries in Africa, and in many other places, we've lost some of these values. We can only rebuild this if we connect back to our heritage as individuals, our cultures, and bring our, the richness of our heritage and cultures to the table, the knowledge about sustainability that is alive in many of the indigenous communities around the planet, reconnecting to nature, to low-impact lifestyles, and bringing traditional solutions and the most innovative solutions together to design for the future in a way where we know that true wealth lies not in another Mercedes or another television. True wealth lies in human connectedness and meaningful lives. But also that we need to find ways to offer young people right livelihood while they're implementing solutions. And social entrepreneurship is absolutely possible. We can heal nature and heal each other while earning sustainable livelihoods. So we've shown around the planet that sustainable living is possible. 
We have shown that eco-villages in the USA lie at 20% of the national average of carbon emissions, in Denmark at 35% of the national average, in Germany at 30% of the national average. <coughs> We're able to do all this. So where do we go from here? Eco-village implements sustainable development goals. And we want to implement eco-villages. We're currently working to create MOUs with different countries. We've just signed an MOU with Morocco this morning for the implementation of eco-villages in Morocco. The Senegalese government is implementing right now a program to transition 14,000 traditional villages to eco-villages. The president of Burkina Faso has just announced a program to transition 2,000 villages to eco-villages in the next five years. As you heard, we just signed a memorandum of understanding with Zimbabwe. China, I've just been to China. They're really interested, the government. So what do we do? We move into a new country, into a region, and we identify those communities that are already implementing change on the ground, that are showing that there is a special power on the ground. We bring in a first level of training and support those communities to look at what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses on the ground, what do we have to build on, what can we activate, what are those leverage points that would make a true difference. They develop their own design for their community and start implementing it, bringing in more stakeholders to really build strong communities of stakeholders around their community. We monitor, evaluate outcomes, we improve the design, so Ecovillage is not an outcome, it's a process that continues over years, and we share the inspiration with others, so that more villages become interested in signing up and want to become part of the process. And as we see in Senegal now, we already have 500 Ecovillages active and thriving on the ground. We can transform whole societies and we believe that we can take care of our climate together. So get in touch with us. We'll be outside also after, uh, after the side event. We're at booth 8A if you want to talk more. And thank you for your attention. <coughs> So right now, we want to go to a very special guest. And many of you will have heard of the incredible efforts that Bhutan is bringing, not only with a global happiness index, in the way what we measure influences what we do next. And today, we wanted to invite Chen Cho Norbu to present here with us. He's the secretary of the National Environment Commission Secretarial of the Royal Government of Bhutan, and he is going to share with us about the program that Bhutan is following to, oh, sorry, one moment. Actually, I just need to open up his presentation. Very good, I got such a good instruction here from the technical team, I'm actually able to do this. I think it's probably this one. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Is that yeah. right? <laughs> here, slideshow, there you go. <laughs> yes, it's coming, we just wait a moment. Ah. Wonderful, it's there. <laughs> So we're really looking forward, and I think we can all learn from the example of Bhutan. So the Global Ecovillage Network also has a chapter in this country, and we'll be speaking more about ecovillage development in Bhutan in the coming days with each other. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, today I'll not speak about gross national happiness. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather focus on carbon negative and still pursuing organic farming. And then I will run through our farming system, rather take you a tour through our farming system next. So this is an, just to give an overview. Uh, just want to say here that, uh, you know, we sequester around 6.3 million tons of carbon annually, and our emission is only about 1.5 million tons 
and that is just based on IPPC guideline, just managed forest. We have not included uh, soil carbon, we have not included grasslands. And way back in COP15 2009, we declared carbon neutral commitment. At that point of time, we didn't get much attention. But in Paris, I think we did get. <laughs> Next. Just to go through, can I start? Just to the trend of our gene emission from Bhutan. I'll just use, show the sectors where the waste, industrial process, energy, agriculture, and overall industry and uh, fossil fuels, it is growing. Now, if you look at the balance, I'm just going to run through those. Agriculture, industrial, waste, and that's our balance we have. So that just gives you an overview how we did arrive to that uh, six million. Now, just to take you through the our farming system. That is our uh, wetland areas. We do also have a problem with our dry land farming, high risk of erosions. If you look at certain corners of our country, when we talk of smart agriculture, I think traditionally communities have been doing it. So we need to learn more from them. I think, to incorporate in our own technology develop development. But there are also challenges, particularly in the urban areas, where there's a lot of pressure on the farming system. Just is, this is just to give you a picture. This is in the capital, uh, 2014. This is what we used to be in 2003. So we are moving fast. Now, when we talk of the carbon negative organic farming, we do have a, our legal instruments, the policies, laws that are in place. And probably, I, I think, in our constitution, if I read this, Article 3, government shall ensure a minimum of 60% of Bhutan's total land shall be maintained under forest cover for all time to come. I think probably this is very unique. Uh, maybe Bhutan is the only country where we reflect concerns within our own environment. And this is <coughs> endorsed in uh, 2008 when we had our first democratic election, they adopted this constitution. Now to talk briefly on strategies and some actions that we have pursued or pursuing. I'm not going to go in detail, but if I just highlight, we're working on low emission development strategies in industries, transport, waste, and construction center. And if you look at in our Paris Agreement, this is what we are supposed to pursue. Then in terms of emission, mass transport, emission standards we have in place, in terms of reducing the fuel consumption, we are trying to promote rural electrification. In terms of sequestration, community forest initiative, we are trying to educate and empower the communities. And of course, last year, our NDC was regarded as one of the most ambitious NDCs that we have submitted. And for the ratification, currently our parliament is in the session, so this is already tabled. So just give you an example on organic farming. As I said, I'll end by looking at our organic farming. Of course, what we pursue there at back home is a mixed farming. And if you look at our plant nutrients, the intake from the chemical fertilizers is very low. Most of them comes from organic residues. And in our organic framework that we have developed, we are encouraging on a very selective sites, selective crops, and integrated approach. And our strategy is not to impose on communities, but rather attract communities to your options that we provide. So with that, I'll end here. Uh, thank you.
Yeah, so this is what can happen when a country empowers its peoples. I love, love the sentence that was, yeah, every Bhutanese is a trustee of the kingdom's natural resources. I think that's the kind of approach that we need and that is also the approach that Jen takes, that we believe that at the heart of the matter, we all care. And if we can tap into that, we believe that in a way, human beings' willingness to be part of the solution is one of the most underutilized resources we currently have on this planet. We just need to show pathways to people. How can they become part of the solution? Many young people currently are truly lost in this question. So we want to give the floor to you now. Um, we have around 10 minutes left, so not so long before our friends will take the stage. But we would love to hear whether there are any questions or comments from you. So please show up and share. Yes, over there. And we have a microphone coming to you. So thank you so much for the panelists for being a role model to follow in terms of creating and showing the real solution to a global climate crisis, which starts at the individual and then at the community levels. Thank you for all of you. Um, part of the problem we're facing as a global community is the reliance or on international transport for food and goods and services that we rely upon every day. So. Eco-villages represent per, per, concretely what should be the strategy in terms of responding and answering the needs of each country's citizens. So I really appreciate the presentations, all of them, especially the one from uh, Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making a barren land a fruitful and rich land and, and really showing that it could, it could be done. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And just in front of you, if you can just pass. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Um, uh, I'm encouraged by my colleague from Zimbabwe. I'm William Gore from South Africa. Uh, you just did highlight the issue of drought. Um, what I've seen is that some of these uh, initiatives uh, do not succeed because water is not readily available. How did you overcome that problem uh, in your country? Because as, uh, 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 as I realize, you are in the same belt as ourselves, where this, uh, the, you know, the level of heat wave has squashed every single Founding every single dam. Uh, in fact, it's a disaster. How did you overcome that during the last uh, years? Thank you. I wouldn't say we over, we've overcome the problem, but um, I can say we are working on it. We are focusing more on rainwater harvesting and infield uh, water harvesting. If you saw in some of the pictures, we are facilitating that children and communities um, dig swells and uh, some infrastructure that can help them to harvest every drop of water. We have um, an, an approach adopted from permaculture, which we call the four S's, the slowing of the water, the spreading of the water, sinking it and shedding it to ensure that whatever drop of water that rains it should be harvested. After harvesting it, we should make sure that we apply shed, which is in form of mulch, to ensure that we do not lose water from evapotranspiration as fast as we could. And that is a helping a bit. And the other issue that we're also focusing on um, is uh, replenishing the water table using the four S's again. Because mostly now, the focus has been on withdrawing water from the from underground everyone is harvesting water drilling boreholes but no emphasis is put in terms of uh, making sure that water gets underground so those are the focus areas that we're focusing on now we cannot control the water that comes as rainwater but the water that comes in 
we have to make sure that we maximize use of it. Yeah, and for instance, an eco-village in Portugal um, is focusing on water retention landscapes. So we've also formed a gen consultancy that brings the, the experts from different eco-villages together who've, who've gained experience around that. And they've formed natural lakes and swales, so that the same solutions that Linda is speaking about in Portugal. And now after three, four years, they've just harvested in a previously totally dry area more than a ton of fruits this year. And the Portuguese government is now looking at following this example because they're actually creating a locally different climate through these water approaches. So I think there is a lot that we can do. Yeah. Maybe we, yeah? Yes. 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 Yes, it's a long-term process. I know I've just been to Zambia where the groundwater level has dropped from minus 50 to minus 60 meters. Thousands of boreholes have dried out, but actually in Zambia, it's still the same amount of water falling. But the water, when it does fall, and even if it's just once a year, it rushes over the land, takes the topsoil into the Zambezi and gone into the Pacific Ocean. It doesn't replenish the soil. So every tree we keep on the land, every tree that is not cut down, every plant helps to, to, to bring every drop of rain into the ground. Every drop of rain is precious at this time, yeah. And our heart goes out to you. Thank you. One last question. Thank you so much. Um, Christine oh. from Uganda. Sorry. Uh, yes, I coordinated a parliamentary forum on climate change. Yeah. Can you stand up so we can? Yes, there you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yes, what you have shared with us actually is the most adequate and appropriate, the principle of inclusiveness. But when we come to mitigation, again, when we take it that everyone's effort counts, then it turns out to be double counting. And the question of double counting then does what comes in. So somehow that one again takes us to reliability on the national efforts and not individual efforts. So the issue of inclusiveness is still a question under mitigation. Thank you. No. On the mitigation part, now I cannot speak on other countries. Within our own system, we do have our own task force to look at what are the activities that are taken into account. So once we bring onto the board, probably the issue of double counting cannot in our context happen. We do take note of the concern, but in our own context, uh, it is uh, something that uh, we can uh, say that it will not happen but definitely is a concern in many parts of the uh, region. Thank you. So I would like to just give one moment for a last comment or question, but you'd have to keep it very short, okay. and we okay. might not answer it, but at least to hear oh, it. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you, I guess. Um, my question is, how do we translate or connect um, what's going on here at COP, the international and national levels, down to the community level and local level, because I agree that uh, community empowerment is really important, but how do we connect all of these different levels and ambition? Well, just really short, we have developed something called the Adaptive Governance Cycle to show how community-led design and action can be integrated with regional sustainable development strategies and in the end, influence national. Actually, what happened in Senegal the, the National Eco-Village Development Program started off with 45 villages on the ground coming together as Gen Senegal and doing something that the government saw was strong, different, self-empowered. And the government learned from this and created a set of policies to support such development. So I think we need to bring the two together. We need to have governments work with communities on the ground. I think uh, if you recall the slide, it seems to me this is the critical issue that we, we 
have to address how to get local communities at the center of the, of the discussion. It means dialogue, it means transparency, it means openness, because we're convinced that communities can and, and are providing solutions if they're given a chance. And of course, one of the major problems actually, and if you look at the debates here, uh, outside this room, um, finance. How, ma how many of these wonderful finance instruments that have been created for climate funds of, this, uh, of one sort or another, how many of them are focused on trying to provide direct support to communities? I think there's a real a paradigm shift needed to put communities right at the center of the process in political terms and also in financial terms so that the appropriate financial instruments are made available to really drive community involvement, because we all know without communities, there is no sustainable development. So with those words, we end this first half of this side event. And thank you so much for your attention and your time. We'll be available afterwards and also at our booth for more questions. And we're totally excited now about the coming presentations. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for saying that. So with this, we would like to continue. This is the International Network for Sustainable Energy. We've been working on a similar concept, but we have been taking the issue that many of our organizations in Enforce has been working on local solutions, more initially in, insula in insulation, like improved cookstoves, like light, rural lighting, like biogas, and now they're seeing that these things to really give development in the countries and then villages which need it, we need to combine it and we'll have stronger if we have them combined and we coined that the eco-village development. And after this short, pr quick number of series, quick presentation from this, we will continue with learning more about renewable energy and transitions to 100% renewable energy on a larger scale. But this next 20 minutes will be about the eco-village development as we see it as a development paradigm and development concept, which we hope could also win more support also at the climate funding and at the climate uh, regime, and that's why we're here. So I'd love to give the word to uh, Kavita Miles, who will start up. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kavita Miles, and I represent INSEDA and the Enforces South Asia Network. Uh, to begin with, um, the Eco-Village Development Program has been implemented in four countries in South Asia, and there are, you will realize that there's many similarities to the GEN program that you just heard about. Uh, we have 21 villages, and from those villages, we, these are certain, certain best practices and certain learnings that we have together uh, come up with based on energy access and improved livelihoods. So I'm going to be presenting those learnings to you today. And hopefully, these can be extrapolated to other parts of the world as well. So um, to begin with, the first slide that you see really talks about, just quickly defines the components of EVD as we, defi as we practice it in our countries, uh, which means, which basically says you give rural inhabitants access to renewable energy technologies, livelihood solutions, training for capacity building, community participation, and most important of all, you tie it together with gender mainstreaming. Uh, so, uh, like a lady in the audience had asked, how do you tie this up together? 
where we do have ideas of how to tie this up with the Paris roadmap as well as SDGs, which some of my other panelists are going to speak about. Uh, so to begin with, how do you, um, how does the EVD provide solutions for energy access and enhancing livelihoods? Now on the slide that you see, uh, next slide, is six technologies. The top three, uh, an improved cook stove, biogas, solar cooking, represent three typical technologies for energy access. Now these are rural communities uh, which are generally off the grid or have very erratic energy supplies. Uh, these are technologies that have been tried and tested in them and are just three of a bundle of energy access technologies that have mitigation and adaptation potential. The three below that you see are specifically adaptation solutions aimed at enhancing the livelihoods, giving access to food security, as well as give, providing income generation uh, opportunities to, to the beneficiaries of the community. For instance, Greenhouse technology, organic gardening, they both provide food security, but the surplus is also used to, to be dried and to be sold in the open market. So that's part of the income generation techniques that we're teaching the beneficiaries about. Now, these are the five recommendations that we've had as, um, as a result of the last few years of our implementation of this project. How, do you, how does EVD, Eco-Village Development, uh, how does it promote universal clean energy access? First of all, decentralized energy access, which is critical in an area that's underserved by a primary grid. Uh, we provide decentralized household access um, by also offering low-cost solutions, uh, highly, um, highly simple to operate solutions as well. We share simple technologies. The, the basic rationale behind this is that for the actual beneficiary and the end user, whatever technology we offer them, like say solar or biogas, should be simple enough for them to operate and to understand as new users, and also to be able to learn how to, how to use and maintain them if required. Then grassroots innovation, very, very important. Uh, at a time when we talk about the paucity of climate finance, we, we need to look towards alternate sources of innovation and not just hi-fi uh, research institute-led uh, led solutions. So we are trying to innovate with grassroots communities as to solutions that work based on participatory needs, need assessments. And finally, we talk about the private sector role, which is really a scaling up strategy that we believe needs to be tapped to, 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 bring, this, to bring these solutions to more people. If you monetize it, we can, get, um, we can get the benefits of economies of scale as well and of mass production. Next slide, please. Uh, next, yeah, oh, sorry, the slide before. Previous one. It's a previous slide, yes. <laughs> sorry. Um, and finally, the how do we improve livelihoods? So generally speaking, gender mainstreaming, like I mentioned before, it's an important process, not just in the planning process, but in the monitoring and reporting process as well. We make sure that women are included in every step of the way. Then income generation, like I mentioned before, uh, this is the most important component to stakeholder buy-in. You need to show them that there is value. Capacity building in the form of education about climate change, about opportunities available to them, as well as skill development. And finally, equitable access to developmental resources, which is something that our most vulnerable communities and our target communities do not have. So thank you. With this, I will, I will pass over the mic to my other colleagues. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, and I would like to give the word to Shovna for Center for Rural Technology from Nepal. Please, Shovna, you have the word. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Shovna Moharjan, representing Center for Rural Technology Nepal, um, which is an NGO working in the renewable energy technology sector in Nepal for more than 27 years. Um, and I'm t I will be talking about how EVD is uh, uh, helping in uh, developing this eco-village converting villages into eco-villages in Nepal. Next slide, so EVD is contributing uh, in achieving national and international goals and targets. So um, the eco-village development program 
uh, is developing this climate resilient agro practices to address food security and it is integrating green energy with agro livelihood as well as optimizing the available uh, local available resources uh, it uh, it is also involving women in uh, selection of EVD uh, solution, as Kavita has mentioned in her presentation. And um, you know, we are under this program, uh, the, we are increasing the access to modern energy technology, and we are also improving the education of uh, children regarding the uh, climate change and other issues. So as a result of capacity building and awareness campaign, uh, people have now started their uh, rep repairing biogas uh, biogas, which was destroyed after the earthquake of 2015. They have now started uh, doing wastewater management and micro irrigation, biocomposting, fish pond, uh, cow shed management, plantation of high value crops and fruit. Uh, as um, an adaptation linking with livelihood, now uh, in the village where there is abundant water resource, uh, people have now started the fish farming they have direct, uh, diverted the water from river to their village and they have now started fish farming and the place where there is uh, there uh, there is a lack of water they have started this rainwater harvesting and they have now also started um, uh, making brooms for, uh, uh, with locally available plant next slide uh, they, they uh, in the eco village in our eco village now people are using this plastic tunnel and drip irrigation so they are now uh, planting this uh, water resistant tomato in off season and earning a lot next slide please however there are some challenges that uh, challenges that uh, peop uh, they uh, some people they do not know how to use the technology hence uh, we believe that schools should be developed as an in uh, information center so that uh, they can get information about climate change this issues and uh, renewable energy technology how it works and uh, how, how can they um, uh, repair and maintain uh, by themselves? And uh, we also believe that uh, climate change should be included in a school level curriculum. This mm. was thank you. Thank you to Shovna and for how you're doing it in Nepal. And then I'd like to give the word to Domindo from uh, IDEA. Mm. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I represent an organization which has been. Uh, working in the rural sustainability sector for over 25 years now. And we are currently working in the eco-village development sector as well. Next slide. Uh, uh, tackling climate change, it's imperative that we have win-win uh, approaches. Now, in that sense, EBD or eco-village development is a win-win approach which improves the lives and livelihoods of people without any compromise on the environment or limited uh, 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 effects on the environment. Uh, in the context of Sri Lanka, we are around 80% of the people live uh, in the rural sector. Uh, it is imperative that we use the scope of EVD solutions to improve their lives and livelihoods especially in terms of agriculture and their use of biomass. Next slide, please. Now, following uh, the COP21 agreement, uh, Sri Lanka launched the Sri Lanka Next Initiative, which uh, pledges uh, with the mitigation and adaptation uh, strategies in Sri Lanka while uh, with a, in a holistic manner, where development is taken place which which improves the environment as well. Now, under this initiative, several programs were uh, blossomed, uh, like the 10,000 uh, Climate Smart Villages program. Uh, and uh, another program uh, is the Non-Toxic Nation program. Now, linkages with these programs can upscale or scale up uh, EVD uh, to a majority of Sri Lanka. Uh, in terms of INDCs and NDCs of Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka recently submitted the first version of NDCs, which focuses on 14 sectors, uh, which uh, has a mitigation, adaptation, loss and damages and means of implementation. 
but EVD or similar initiatives are not being specifically mentioned in our NDCs. However, since, since EVD involves and touches many sectors, it's very hard to uh, measure the mitigations or measure the, measure the emissions. And if you want to incorporate uh, emissions and, uh, or EVD uh, under NDCs, it's imperative that we have uh, a mechanism to measure the mitigations. So be because it, has, uh, it covers a lot of sectors, not only energy, agriculture, households, rural industries, and many sectors. So it's very important how we uh, quantify the emissions in, in, in the roadmap to including EVD as a solution under the NDCs. Now, EVD is a bottom-up approach where the priority is to fill, fulfill the requirement of villagers, farmers, women, and, uh, and uh, rural communities, and uh, to design solutions in such a way it works for them. So aggregating adaptation mitigation targets across and up uh, come secondary because all should start from the local level itself. That's what we believe in. All targets and commitments uh, which are to be in, incorporated in the NDCs and INDCs should come from the bottom itself. So we have to first fulfill the requirements of the local communities and we should have a mechanism where we can quantify the mitigations and uh, adaptation practices as well. Thank you. Yes, um, let me give the word to Hassan from Grameen Shakti in Bangladesh. Hello, uh, good evening and assalamu alaikum. I'm Hassan um, from Grameen Shakti and Bangladesh. Yes, you'll be here the uh, Bangladesh is most vulnerable country uh, to climate change. I would not use that word. Bangladesh has shown a pathway for sustainability through installation of 4 million solar home systems within 16 years. That's the history. So that we all are of our friends to establish the eco-village development, we came here with some evidence and these are a couple of evidence we have shown here. So that is a solar home system by which you can reduce kerosene fuel, by which you can change your life every day and definitely free of indoor air pollution. You will hear UNICEF report has been published 31st October this year. So thousands of children die just due to indoor air pollution. So that is one of the tools we are establishing in our village that you can reduce indoor air pollution. And second one, improved cookie stove. Millions of improved cookie stove have been installed in Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Definitely, you are going to reduce your indoor air pollution same way you are reducing volume of fuel load. Biogas plant, it's a huge number of biogas plant have been constructed in all of our, in the South Asia. You are getting a smoke-free smoke kitchen, and not only smoke-free kitchen, after cooking gas, after decomposition of your item, you are getting very good organic fertilizers that you can use for your organic farming. Organic farming is not so much common in my country, but through the eco village development demonstration by the enforced activities, we are sharing our knowledge to each other. So what the pictures I have uh, used here, this is from Sri Lanka, that we are trying in Bangladesh. How money will come? We did not hear, uh, came here with an empty hand. That's the couple of funds that Bangladesh have generated last couple of years. Bangladesh Climate Trust Fund, around 400 million US dollar have been allocated for last seven years. At least they have proposed some fund. Second one, the central bank. No commercial bank will come forward to work with renewable energy if you work in a village area where people do not have any certain monthly income. However, central bank, they came forward to do something, they are going to invest 200 million US dollar. Another program, very good program for uh, elimination of poverty, that is food for work in Bangladesh, run by Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief. So we are providing some money to the unskilled worker living in the village, and half of the money will go for solar home system, biogas, and improved cookie stove. Yes, it's not our single journey. Lots of multi-donor uh, have given 
fund to us. That is one of them, Bangladesh Climate Change Resilience Fund. $188 million have been formed by Sweden, Switzerland, European Union as well. Now, yes, we have something, but this is very tiny amount to work in the developing country. For that reason, we are thinking that this equivalence development approach you can include as a project proposal for GCF fund. For your example, we are trying our best, whatever we'll get or not is another issue, but we are working on submission for GCF fund based on equivalence development. Definitely, there are lots of funds for uh, mitigation, for adaptation, whatever fund is available, we would try our best to show this equivalence development. It's very important to influence all the government agencies to comprehensive this model in their national adaptation or in their national action plan or five years, 10 years, 10 years whatever you have, you can propose your equivalence development to the government. Everyone who are sitting in the panelists, everyone who are sitting, very nice audience, everyone we came here to save our environment, including my friends behind IT staff who are just transmitting our voice to the rest of the world. Everyone, we are trying our best to save the environment, to save the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Hassan and then to our last speaker, Santosh from Climate Action Network, South Asia. You have the word. Thank you, Gunnar. <clears throat> so we have heard uh, some wonderful examples of, uh, of, of solutions, of, uh, of climate solutions, which are really uh, able to solve some of the very complicated problems in South Asia, in Africa, in some other advanced countries. So why uh, these things are not going, uh, are being uh, scaled up? There, there are several instruments are needed to, to make these solutions really solving uh, our, our, our problems of the, of the earth. Regional cooperation, one, uh, it, one of the instruments which is going to have a larger impact is going to uh, uh, take care of some, some of the issues which we are experiencing at regional level. As, we, as you must have noticed, that we represent South Asia and uh, it's one of the most vulnerable regions across, uh, across the world after maybe Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, we have gathered a lot of capacity over the years. Now, Bangladesh is the storehouse, a powerhouse of adaptation activities. Sri Lanka has gathered, as you have seen, a lot of uh, uh, information, a lot of knowledge on implementing uh, um, improved cook stoves. India has been, a power, uh, has been conducting uh, several uh, eco-village development uh, activities, uh, including uh, what we have been doing. So these informations need to be shared among, among, um, among the needy in, in regional level so that these informations uh, can be taken up by uh, vulnerable, other vulnerable areas and solve their own issues. Now, uh, these, why you should do that? Because climate change issues are really transboundary, cross-sectoral, and are um, cross-cutting in nature. Uh, we have been grappling with issues like uh, glacial lake outburst floods, which is really um, affecting India and Nepal. Uh, if, we have, if we have floods, uh, which affects India and Bangladesh, and also uh, to some extent in um, um, Sri Lanka. So common problems are being experienced, and regional cooperation is going to have uh, the kind of impact we would like to have it. Uh, we have kind of unexplored, uh, underexplored capacity, uh, and, and we have the resilience to, to do it. So uh, we should be able to uh, over, overcome all the climate vulnerabilities by uh, implementing all these solutions across the globe. Uh, we have the communities of researchers, academics, uh, policy practitioners, uh, which have been working in, in this area for quite a long time. So this will be the opportunity, this is the time uh, to have those knowledge, the research, development, demonstration, uh, to, to be shared along with, uh, with, uh, with all of us so that these things can be really taken up at the ground level. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So to send us, we've come to the end of the short presentation of this activity. We have made a report about it that you can pick up at the end of the uh, room on your way out and beside that we'll be available for questions after the next session or the next part of the session which will start now about 
transition to 100% renewable energy and uh, zero carbon. Please uh, come up here. My, by the way, my name is Gunnar Boy Olsen. I'm coordinator of uh, Inforce. So with that, I would like to give the word first. Uh, Preben, would you like to take the well, say I'll take championship now. Okay. Yeah, so I'd like to give the word to Preben. May I go? So thank you to Gunnar for taking us till now. <coughs> so, um, well, we are little behind schedule, so, uh, but I invite you still to participate in this last part of our uh, presentation here. And uh, this is focusing at, especially at uh, the renewable energy. We have two speakers here, but I want to make a short introduction also. As we have heard in several cases here, the fossil fuels is the main cause of the climate change, and then the alternatives to the fossil fuels, that the renewables will be the solution. For decades, the work for renewable energy has been uphill, but it is no more so. You may still think it's uh, the, 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 the minority energy solutions that are being uh, developed now, but we are at a historical crossover point, and um, the International Renewable Energy Agency <coughs> uh, could inform last year that by 2013, 58%, 58% of all new electricity generation capacity was based on renewables. So that means that the non-renewables is now the, the smallest part of it, just 42% it was in 2013, and we can expect that now it's about two-thirds of all investments uh, or all installation that is going for renewables. And this is a new situation we are in. And the driver for this development is primarily the low cost, especially of solar and a wind. And we are here in Morocco, and they have huge projects in Morocco uh, with costs guaranteed for 15 years, which are far below the cost we see now of fossil fuel solutions. So this is an interesting uh, uh, development we're seeing. But we do not still think that the, so that the sun is still shining only on the renewable energy. By nature, it is a decentral kind of energy, and that marginalizes the role of the old big energy monopolies. We've seen here that they got a new president in the United States that declared that the, the, coal, the coal age is going to come back, and he must most likely cancel the Paris Agreement, which the United States joined last year. The EU Commission is also preparing a directive that by 2020 may make community power a dream of the past. I just want to make you aware of this situation here because it's going to make it difficult to develop renewable energy projects in the future because there's some fighting back. Don't believe that everyone in the world wants to do so, want to go renewables. It's not so. So please uh, also be aware of this when we work on this at the political level, make your influence so that we can come back on tracks and make the promotion of renewable energies. This was my short message here in the introduction. And then I'll give the word to uh, Paul Allen for Center of Alternative Technology in Wales in the United Kingdom. He'll be speaking about transition to zero carbon. How can we make it happen in the United Kingdom based on a new report that is a very interesting paper, I can tell you. Thank you very much. Please take the floor, please. Okay. Well, part of what we're here really is to recognize the role of the long industrialized countries in increasing ambition for their rate of decarbonization to allow the majority world a fair share of the residual carbon that we can safely burn. Paris Agreement was a real turning point. It, 
It is a global acceptance of the science is proven, except perhaps Donald Trump. The rest of the world, I think, will accept that. We also have all the technologies we need for this transition. We have been modeling a zero carbon future for over 10 years at the Center for Alternative Technology, and all of our work is available to download as models for Britain. But we've also pulled together a report called Who's Getting Ready for Zero that brings high ambition scenarios from 100 countries around the world to show we have the technology to do this. So if the 